Hi. Can the mic hear me now if I stand right here? All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, why nobody wants to work with security uh, based on a little bit of my own experience and a little bit of things I've seen. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been working in security for about nine years and I started as a pen tester uh, 12 years ago. So I started bug hunting when I was very young. Um, and this talk grew out of a, a conversation I was having with a friend of mine uh, with regards to he really wanted to get into security and he'd been to four different security conferences and he realized that security people were jerks and that he didn't want to work with any of them and he was really discouraged because it was a discipline that he really thought was interesting but he felt really really unwelcome and so I as a security person immediately was like that's not true and we started arguing back and forth and I realized he really did have a point point. Um, and thus thus this talk was born. Um, so I've, I've highlighted three different problems for why nobody wants to work with security and how to make us a more welcoming community. Um, I am now the head of security for a medical company, so I've come from penetration testing and been shoved up the ranks most unwillingly, um, but I obviously love my job. But uh, when I started, this definitely was not the position that I saw myself winding up in. Uh, this is the sea level. Um, and the problem with the sea level from an outsider's perspective is that the only thing they do is policy and paperwork. They do a lot of KPIs, they have a lot of ISO, and they do a lot of very boring PowerPoint presentations like this one. Uh, if we look at, well, it's, it's important to be critical of yourself. Um, and when we're looking at it from a security conference perspective, I mean, even here at OWASP, which is a great conference, don't get me wrong, but there's the CISO track and there's the techie track. And if you're looking to get into security, you're not going to go for, I love to write boring policies because no one ever says that. And if you're looking at, I want to get into security, I want to be a pen tester, no one is going to go to the CISO track and learn about boring policy. And that's kind of what you're presented with, is that it's either you're a policy person or you're a techie person. There is no middle ground at all. And I experienced this myself because I started as a penetration tester and I thought that my CISO was an idiot. Because I did. I mean, I'm brutal, brutal honesty. I thought that the dude did absolutely nothing. Like he'd go to meetings, and he'd sit there and he'd say, "This isn't the policy." And I had, and I had no understanding of that at all. And what was worse is that I didn't go to the CISO track because I had no interest, and so I didn't understand why policy was actually important. And so, for him, from his perspective, I was an arrogant shit. And full disclosure, I was an arrogant shit. <laughs> and from my perspective, he didn't actually offer me anything of value because I could get around the policy, the password policy. You know, I didn't understand the acceptable use policy. I mean, by a show of hands, who remembers the IT security policy that you actually signed? There's one dude. I actually, I actually read it. You actually read it. Do you actually remember it? No. No. And I, I kind of rest my case because it's an important document. It's an important document from an ISO standard, from auditing standards, from just a user standard, so that new people can actually understand that the user policy but no one actually reads it and understands it and remembers it. Yet everybody has to have one. We've all signed one. I've written it and signed it and gun to my head, I don't know if I remember it. Next big problem is the penetration tester. This is obviously a picture of me at work um, on a daily basis. I will never get over my disappointment about the fact that my job is not this cool. But if you look at what Hollywood presents, if you look at what DEF CON, Black Hat, CCC, they all present this idea of that all security work is exploits all of the time. And I can say that while penetration testing is super important, it is not the be and end all of all security work. And so if you're talking to somebody that's new and they're not a coder, they're not a techie, how are they going to get involved in the security community at all if those two aren't their focus areas? It's, it's, it's an open question. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But if this is the only thing that we're viewing as of value, then we're not going to get into having a diversity of thought, a diversity of opinion, a diversity of kind of people that come in because the only people that we are attracting are penetration testers. Because as a security community, and I'm saying this generally, not to every specific person, but these are the people that we are saying offer the greatest value. I have never been to a techie talk where the techie person highlights the value of actually having a policy. So. Just an open one. Um, and the other day I was on Twitter, which I very rarely am, but there was a very interesting story on the fact that there are almost no security people, so there's a huge resource gap. Like, everybody needs to hire more people, yet there are no people to actually be hired. 
And so here we have the resource level that we're working with. As you can see, it's, we have a, a great level of resources. And what's interesting here is the fact that how many entry level jobs has anyone seen? I think, I think I've seen two and I've been looking for them. And those two that I saw required experience of seven to 10 years and they were entry level for juniors. And they had to have a whole host of CISSP, Security Plus, CEH, oh, you know, the, the offensive security. So you, you had to have all of these certificates, but it was an entry level job for seven to 10 years experience necessary. It's true. Rather than becoming a community where we can have an entry level job with no experience necessary, I, I challenge you with the thought that we could have a penetration tester that sits in house with no experience that we send to conferences or that we send to trainings and actually invest in that person. They will eventually have seven to 10 years experience. <laughs> but if you're, if you're kind of going out with everyone needs to have at least seven to 10 years experience before they can start at all, and then in the next sentence complaining the fact that no one wants to work with you, we have nobody to work with, help, help, then we have kind of an insurmountable problem. So a way to move forward. I would argue that policy needs to be written for the people that actually use it. So a recommendation from my perspective is that if you have to have an ISO or if you're being audited, you can write policies that are auditable, that are the big fancy documents that everybody needs, but then actually have a policy that's written for the people who use it. And that policy doesn't have to be 80 pages. That can be a policy on an A4 page, a little short, tiny policy that you can give that person and they can actually remember. So you can have auditable policy and then you can have actual policy. So that way the person will actually remember the IT security policy. They'll actually remember the password policy. They'll actually remember the policies that they should be following. I mean, by a show of hands, how many people have a privacy policy at work? Four, five, GDPR comes into effect next year, six. This is definitely one of the most important policies from the GDPR perspective, seven. <laughs> a very willing seven, they're eight. <laughs> Thank you from Black Dog. <laughs> um, and it's, an, it's a critical policy. And most people don't have it. And if they do, they don't remember it. So you can absolutely have a policy that you can present to an auditor. You can give it to P PwC. You can give it to Deloitte, whoever it is. And in that policy, you can, hand, you can kind of refer to, and this is the policy that people have at their desks. They have it on a USB stick, something that they can actually read that's bullet pointed, that's actually useful. Technologists, and this is myself included, become because I come from a techie background and this is somewhere that I still struggle, we need to be able to understand that not all security is in code. The best example of this is probably the Bose headphones. Does everyone remember this? The Bose headphones, they were spying on their users, sending them, you know, sending the terrible music onto somebody else. And I have these headphones and I was on the train listening to those same headphones, reading the news. And I realized that my headphones are spying on me, according to this article. And what the article highlighted was the fact that in the terms and conditions, this had been pointed out. The data was being aggregated and being sent to a third party. And I was sitting there and I was like, I'm a security person. I accepted those terms and conditions. I have the app. Granted, my user was sparkly, you know, sparkly thunderpants or something like that. And they realized that, you know, my terrible music collection is not you know, connected to me, but I'd accepted those terms and conditions and I looked at the app and I hadn't noticed the fact that it was actually sending my data on. I hadn't. And so it's, you can either question my competency or you can look at who would have found that particular bug because it's not a bug. It's a privacy violation that a penetration tester would have never found. And if we're stuck in the mindset that all security is locked in code, we will never find those bugs. There are logical bugs, there are privacy bugs, and if we, we have to be able to step out of the, the technology bubble and see those types of things. Entry-level jobs, and I highlighted this and I'm going to highlight it again. If you have the ability to mentor somebody, if you have the ability to help somebody, or if you have the ability to actually create an entry-level job, please do. Um, because we have to expand our community and we have to have a, a diverse set of skills. And we won't be able to have that diversity if we don't ourselves create uh, an environment that encourages that. So I have a little user group that I run in Sweden. So if any of you are in Sweden, come hang out with me, um, where the entire purpose of our user group is just entry level. So the user group is human level, it's for new people and new people only. So while we encourage people with more technological skill to come, it's specifically done for new people. And finally, and this is probably one that's 
for more people that hang out on Twitter more than I do, we need to be more welcoming of a, a, a diversity of thought. Um, Twitter, the pile on there can be extremely deadly. And you can see it at security conferences as well that my exploit is bigger than your exploit, which means I'm a cooler person. So we have to be more accepting of the fact that people can have different opinions. And that's not always a bad thing. So please be more open is, is my final thought. And that's all I had. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Sarah? Can you? Huh? All right, go ahead. Can you tell us about your group in Sweden? <laughs> What, what's the main focus or what are the services provided to the community? We have, it's called security. Uh, <laughs> it is, because I don't drink beer. I okay. only drink tea. And so, and I have a weird sense of humor. Okay. So we have all, <laughs> I don't. And so we have a lot of different types of speakers that come to us. And we've had uh, Anne-Marie Lewinder, who's one of the key holders for the DNSSEC. Uh, we've had penetration testers, we've had security developers, we've had uh, people from OWASP, we have a developer that's specialized in PKI, but we have lots of different types of people that come, and my requirement, because I have no money, so this is me begging and pleading, please come, um, is that they, keep, <laughs> that they keep their talks with the assumption that the audience has a, a knowledge level of zero, and so that they have to keep the talk, that everyone should walk away from that talk feeling like I learned something, regardless of what they brought to the talk with them. So we've had a few success stories where we've had people that come in that don't know what HTTPS is, and that are now working as testers with a security focus. And I would say that we need to have more conferences and need to have more user groups that have that as kind of an input, because everyone knows that the general knowledge of security is super low but how many classes do we have that are actually catering to people that have no knowledge? You might not know what HTTPS is. You might not know that TLS is there. You might not know all of these things, but where are you gonna to go to learn that in a welcoming environment that isn't DEF CON, Black Hat, CCC, where, where the skill level is you know, way up here if I'm down here. I mean, that's a pretty significant gap. Go where, ahead. Where are based in Sweden more specifically? Malmö, oh. very base. Like I said, we have free beer, free pizza. I'm there. Um, I mean, where, where do I put my CV? <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, I mean, any anyone is welcome. But the the goal of the group is definitely new people. So, if you want to come, you're more than welcome. We're always looking for more people. Yeah, uh, think more about from the recruitment perspective, or is uh, incubating new people if yeah. we could uh, contribute in some. Certainly, like I said, anybody, I mean, you can, if you want to come speak to my group, if you want to come hang out with the group, write to me on Twitter. I will be the most grateful person on earth. You will have my undying gratitude. Uh, and I mean, we're a group of 45 people that show up regularly once a month. Um, and like I said, the skill level, the requirement is zero, but we definitely have some people that do a lot of capture the flags that still come because they're still learning stuff. I mean, there there's a million things in security that I don't know, despite the fact that I've been doing it forever, what feels like forever at least. And it's the only thing I know how to do, but I still learn things and that's that's why I stay in security because I find it fascinating. You had a question in the back? Uh, yeah, just so for real entry level positions where we're not looking for the seven years of experience and the wrath full of qualifications, <laughs> what sort of qualities do you think we should be looking for in those people? Bravery. I would honestly, I would say the, the quality you're looking for is bravery. <clears throat> because if you have someone that's brave enough to say, I don't know, then already you have someone that's able to start the conversation. The best security people I know are the ones that are brave enough to stand up and just be like, you know what, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because then you can have a conversation and either explain to that or just be like, shit, dude, I don't know either. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> You're going to have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I found so many risks at my own company from my own developers being like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, ah, uh, crap. Uh. <laughs> See, better. Um, so no, I would say bravery. Having someone that's actually able to say they don't know. Having someone that's brave enough to be like, I don't know, but I will find out. Because everyone can Google. Everyone can be sent on a course, and if you have someone that's brave enough to ask the question, brave enough to actually gather that information, that person is worth their weight in gold. So yes, bravery. Another question? Just on the 
policy that needs to be written for people that actually use it. How successful have you found that? So we've, we've tried to have a, a one-minute policy version, um, and it just turns into utter rubbish because someone tries to cram every special word from the big policy onto one page, and it still makes no sense. What is the policy for, would be my answer. A password policy, what problem are you actually trying to solve? You can't have the same policy for every single account here. Good. The policy has to be a certain length. That's two sentences. If you have a third sentence, you have to change your policy every three months if you're following the typical best practice. It's three sentences. Yeah, when we, because that's part of the information security policy, when you try and cram the, all of the information security on a single page, you just end up with buzzwords. Mm, true, but it depends on, do you have to do that for every policy? And I'd probably say no. So if you have someone that's sitting in support, ask yourself instead, what policies are actually relevant to this person's job? Yeah. So you'd have a, a short version for different yeah. cases. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what, what policies are relevant for a developer? Please, for the love of God, don't post your key to Stack Overflow. Sentence one. <laughs> I've seen that, which is why I highlight it, because I've actually seen that. Um, that would be sentence one. And so, yeah, I mean, you could, I would say that spending the time to actually figure out what policies apply to that person is well worth their time. And if you, they, if you then sit with that person and be like, this is the only thing you have to know. There's a huge document that you don't have to care about, but know these five things and we're good. Then I would say that's well, that's well worth the time investment. I think there was one more question. Nope. All right then. Well then, thank you very much. <laughs>